All right, so I also have a distinct pleasure to introduce our inaugural director of that center. And it's somebody who I have come to really know and respect and worked with at the State Department. As Bonnie Glick, who was the chief operating officer of USAID, she also uh, is a veteran at IBM. She holds three patents. But more than that, she's been a public servant her, for a good part of her career. Uh, working at the State Department, the White House, National Security Council. We're absolutely thrilled to have Bonnie Glick as our inaugural director for our center. Bonnie, could you come on out? How good right. was that? Good. Good Thank you. you. All right, they got the chairs. Good luck. Keith, thank you so much. Thanks for the very kind introduction. I'm pleased to introduce the senior senator from the great state of Indiana, Senator Todd Young, to offer some remarks on the semiconductor industry, chips and chains. Well, <laughs> thank you, Bonnie, for that introduction. It's, it's so good to be with you and Keith and, and so many other great leaders and aspiring leaders uh, uh, in this field. And I want to thank the Center for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue for inviting me to uh, enjoy, join this broader conversation. Um, it's really an honor to speak with you and everyone who's tuned in to the Concordia Summit. I'd like to speak with you this morning about my Endless Frontier Act, uh, which recently passed, passed the United States Senate on a bipartisan basis and it's making its way through the U.S. House of Representatives. I co-authored the Endless Frontier Act with Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, and I'm proud of the bipartisan work to invest in America's future. Our legislation shifts America's posture from defense to offense when it comes to China. It gives our citizens the tools and means to out-innovate, out-compete, and outgrow the Chinese Communist Party. But this legislation and this moment are not simply about beating China. They're about using the challenge of communist China to become a better version of ourselves. In America, where opportunity spreads and innovation never stops. The Endless Frontier Act, also known as EFA, seeks to encourage, extend, and then leverage that very American impulse in ways unseen since the space race will change the way the federal government invests in key technologies, and it will fund projects in fields such as AI, quantum computing, robotics, and biotech. This will be possible because of a bipartisan $81 billion strategic investment in the National Science Foundation, bolstering science and technology research and development, including $29 billion in a brand new Tech and Innovation Directorate at the National Science Foundation. It will also deliver an additional $10 billion to establish regional tech hubs across the heartland to launch innovative companies, revive American manufacturing, and create new jobs to jumpstart our local communities. This is especially important in places like Indiana. Just five cities, Boston, San Diego, San Francisco, San Jose, and Seattle enjoyed more than 90% of the job growth in advanced sectors like tech, computer manufacturing, biotech, and telecom between 2005 and 2017, 90%. In 2019, only three coastal states, California, Massachusetts, and New York, made up more than 75% of all venture-backed investments in the United States. EFA will help more Americans in more parts of America get more skin in the game. This will have enormous economic consequences. The race to put a man on the moon led to domino effect developments in aerospace and consumer electronics, computing. These advance, advances kick-started the economic engine of America in the decades following the Second World War. The same, the, the frontier technologies of the future have the same potential, perhaps even more so, to create new avenues for 
good work for all Americans. They will influence everything from transportation to our national security base to education and health care. This investment is critical for both the future of work in the United States and for our national security as we compete with communist China. Finally, EFA contains provisions that will secure our supply chains and reduce our vulnerability to competitors holding critical supplies hostage. We're seeing how important this is right now as we face a global semiconductor chip shortage. After being voted out of the Commerce Committee by an overwhelming vote of 24 to 4, EFA was merged with other important bills that will help our diplomatic and development posture, preserve our domestic manufacturing capability, and protect our hard-earned research and intellectual property. Critically, the larger package the Senate considered included an important $52 billion investment in the semiconductor research in fabrication. I'm proud of the work the Senate has done in passing this legislation under regular order and permitting input from both parties. Hundreds of proposals, Republican and Democratic alike, were included in the overall package. This legislation proves that we can indeed come together and make the 21st century the second American century. Thanks so much for having me. Good luck. Senator Young, thank you so much for your brilliant remarks. Grateful for your engagement on this, particularly in the field of semiconductors and the expansion of opportunity across the United States. It's now my pleasure to bring back to the stage Dr. Meng Tian, the Dean of Engineering and Executive Vice President of Purdue University. Good to see you. Good to see you again, Bonnie. Well, warm congratulations, Bonnie, first of all. Thank and you. we are honored to have you as the leader for Center for Dipl Diplomacy, Tech Diplomacy at Purdue. And I know that you were trained as a career diplomat, but you also spent 12 years at IBM in the semiconductors business. So Bonnie, what is your view in terms of the role that the United States plays in the global supply chain of semiconductors, and how has that evolved over the past few decades? Mung, it's a good question, and semiconductors were not sort of a normal kitchen table conversation up until COVID. And with the advent of COVID hitting the United States and, and all Americans and really people all over the world seeing the shortage in the supplies of semiconductors in critical industries, particularly automobiles, electronics, and appliances, we see the need to ramp up manufacturing of semiconductors. In the US, we used to manufacture around 37% of the global supply of semiconductors. We're down now to around 12% of that supply with other countries, particularly in Asia, Taiwan, South Korea, picking up a lot of that outsourced extra manufacturing. It's an enormous quantity but the U.S. has maintained its advantage in terms of the highest end of R&D on semiconductors, including now there are companies, including my own former company, IBM, that is designing two nanometer semiconductor chips. This is the width of a strand of DNA. So the U.S. remains at the cutting edge of the supply chain while partnering in our efforts to onshore, nearshore, and allied shore critical manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned onshore, nearshore, allied shore. A and I'm curious, Mung, if in your view, you can share with us a little bit about what you see as global manufacturing and the direction that it should be going. Yeah, Bonnie, I think you're right that uh, there is, has been a lot of evolution in the role that the U.S. plays. And now people are talking about onshoring, nearshoring, ally shoring. I think the answer to your question is more nuanced, perhaps. It depends on which part of the supply chain we're talking about. And you highlighted manufacturing. There's also fabulous chip design companies. And then within manufacturing, they need gas and material coming from other companies. They need tooling machinery, hardware, and software tools to go into the 
factory, and then they need also after the manufacturing stage go into test assembly uh, and packaging before it can be shipped out to the customers. So this supply chain snakes around the world multiple times, and we have to define the answer, how much onshoring is needed versus how much ally shoring is needed based on which step of the supply chain we're talking about. So it's not a single number. It's not 100%, it's not 50%. It is a suite of numbers depending on which chain you're looking at and which step of that chain you're looking at. That's, uh, I could not agree with you more. I think a lot of it plays into what Senator Young was talking about with the Endless Frontiers Act and repositioning the United States in that space to take the critical role of doing what we do well, but understanding as well that we have partners who can help us with the uh, worldwide global distribution of semiconductors directly into industry and directly into manufacturing. Yes. But like you said, multiple steps. Yes, and Bonnie, you're right that it is not easy to imagine that 100% of the capacity of 100% of the steps of all the supply chains will all be within the United States. So it's a strategic choice over there and sequencing, but also it involves partners and like-minded nations. And there's a lot of talk about the quad. And what do you think about maybe a semiconductor's quad? I love the idea of a semiconductor's quad for our audience the National Security Quad that's been reinvigorated and that we'll see meeting later this week is the Quad Democracies of the United States, India, Japan, and Australia. Uh, the idea of having a semiconductor's quad to include the United States, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, maybe expanding it into a quint to include some EU countries as well, I think is something that makes sense. Uh, we think about manufacturing, we think about global supply chains, and it's really important to consider that we have reliability built into those supply chains. Who are reliable partners? Keith Kroc talked about this in the form of trust. Who are our most trusted partners around the world? And those are democracies around the world. So a quad or a quint or a, a any plus whatever, I think is very valuable to consider in light of emerging technologies. We don't in the United States have a monopoly on all of the great ideas and innovations. But if COVID has taught us anything, it's that those who do have those great ideas have to be brought together and have to collaborate together. The more that we can trust our partners around the world, the better off we're going to be technologically and through innovation. I'm wondering, from your perspective, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, those governments all invest in their technologies. We tend to have free markets in the United States. We, we talk about things like industrial policy and we're unsure how comfortable we are as a country with that. What's your thinking about sort of limited industrial policy? Well, Bonnie, I think this is not about industrial policy. Semiconductors such as CHIPS Act that Senator Young of Indiana just mentioned, as well as the Endless Frontier Act, it's fundamentally about two other things, especially when it comes to the semiconductors industry. First, it is about a national security and economic security. And second, it is about leveling the playing field. It takes more money to create and to operate a large scale cutting edge fab, say three nanometers or even lower feature size in the United States, in part because we value labor rights, environmental protection, and due processes. So the cost is higher to create and to operate here. It is about leveling the playing field in a free market competition. And it is about securing national and economic security. Now, Bonnie, we talked quite a bit about how technology could be easily abused to lock in the nightmarish Orwellian vision of 1984. But we also believe that technology must advance freedom. 
What is your vision for tech diplomacy in the coming decades? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, and it's something that we're all seeing, technology, innovation, has come out of the back office. We used to think about the IT people in the back room without very good ventilation. It was always really cold back there. Uh, it's really important for us now to understand that technology and innovation are part of national security conversations. And so the Center for Technology Diplomacy is going to focus on that intersection of technology and national security in the form of diplomatic relations, in the form of innovative relations, and expanding those across the world. It's so exciting, it's important, uh, and the time is now. We're the only ones who are doing it, and it's important to show and lead the way for the rest of the world. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Again, we are honored to have you as the leader for Center for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue. And tomorrow, I believe that uh, Purdue President Mitch Daniels will introduce Keith Kroc and the Intel CEO, Pat Gelsinger, to continue the conversation of chip diplomacy. Stay tuned. Thank, Thank you, you all. all.